So, moving suck it. This is the fourth time in two years. So. And we've lost Godzilla. So I'm, I'm feeling like we've lost like the, the mantra and the object of this seminar series. So I am bereft. But good morning and thank you for fitting us in with your busy schedule. Alyssa, hello, colleagues. I am so excited to see you. I will start with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present, and any Indigenous colleagues with us today. And look, this is the penultimate, colleagues. This is our second last reading seminar series. And thanks for that. Those of you that saw Alyssa do that, there was a lot of head movement going on there with a cup that is matching her t-shirt. That's just fantastic, thank you. So look, today's book is, a, is an interesting one. So it's Living a Feminist Life. It is so appropriate that we have this conversation now. Once more, we're at Duke University Press is the publisher and it's 2017. So we've been on a journey that basically moved through the 2010s, but also the 2000s. So we had 20 years of a movement through this woman's career. So it's been quite fascinating to see the changes to academic life through these books. But I wanted to start with the big change of this book. And it is really lovely, lovely to have Romy with us because again, she's talked quite often through this series about the importance of the blog. And this, of course, and I'll quote Sarah Ahmed, where she stated, this is the first time I've written a book alongside a blog, right? So let's, let's start there. I want to talk about, if I can with you all, research dissemination, okay? So how we get our ideas out into the world. So how do you think books are written now? Should we be bothering with books now? And how does social media like blogs transform what we write? And look, Leanne, I might start with you because you've written you know, books, like two books in two years, basically, and you're not really blogging. So Leanne, talk to me about writing books, women, if you like, and social media. Go for it. Oh, yeah, start with the big one there, Tara. That's yeah. okay. No, it's yeah. a thing. It's a real thing. It is. And, um, okay, well, I, I, I have to just sit here for a moment and think about this. I think about writing. Um, as you know, I do my writing external to everything else. So, and perhaps you and I are very similar in that way, um, that I kind of have work and then I have the writing. So my writing has never been um, it, you know, part of my employment. It's never been something that I've ever been paid to do. Yes. So that means it occupies a very, uh, uh, unfortunately, sometimes a very liminal space. So a lot of the writing I do is professional writing for the workplace. And so that's why I guess I don't blog, which is probably interesting because but maybe I should. Um, no, I find, no, I don't know. I think uh, for me, blogging is a different modality of writing than academic writing. And maybe that's not such a good way to think about that. If you think about research dissemination, mm -hmm. if you know, blogging is a way to make that work a little more accessible, I would suggest. Although perhaps we shouldn't be dividing that so clearly. Um, write, writing books is so important, I think, because it allows ideas to percolate in a very different way, I think, in a more um, complex way that allows an idea to flow from you know, beginning to end. It allows an idea to be fleshed out and developed, you know, and even then not fully but still to the completion of the, of the author to a certain extent, whereas belonging to me seems like an ongoing space of processing an idea. Yes. I mean, the only person we know, Leanne, obviously Steve did blog his way through theoretical times and he did use it as a scaffold. So here mm. is an idea. Let's write a thousand words and see if it flies. Now, with Sarah Ahmed, she uses it differently, I think. She, she is writing the books, but the, the outlier projects appear to come 
but they are blogs that come from the book. So the other way, it's the inside out rather than the outside in. Yes, and I don't know if I have a, actually have a lot to say of that in the moment. It's something that it's going to have to be something maybe I think about a little bit more. It's something I've never done, so uh, you know. And that's right, and Leanne, I, I don't do it either because if I'm writing, I will write a book, I will write a refereed article, or I will write journalism for which I demand that I'm paid. Yes, and and because I very rarely get paid for it, I don't. Yeah, but that's but that's the thing. Do you want to be doing it for for free and have other people like, for example, the conversations? A great example. Um, they don't pay their authors uh, for the journalism, and it, and it's work. It's real work. I'm getting and get to talk to me, Leanne, and then we'll go to Thomas on this. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it, you've I guess you've thrown me a curveball. First up, I haven't thought through this relationship between. I can see why it's important for. How, how some people it works really well for them. Uh, I haven't ever examined a, well, the reason why I don't do it. Um, it's, it. So I haven't thought through that reasoning. Yeah. Um, so for me, the writing is, I have to be in a particular space to do it. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. So, yeah, so for me, because my writing has always been outside of other things, it's very segmented, it's very separated that it's kind of, it, it doesn't exist as a thing that flows through my every day, which makes me kind of sad in a way. It's something that kind of, there's a time and a space that it happens and then it stops. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I guess I see blogging as something that is a bubbling kind of percolation throughout an every day. So maybe somebody who actually does it can actually talk through how and why they do that and how that works for them it's, it's, for me because it's I have to segment my life very much that there's paid work that pays the bills there's paid writing and then there's the writing that I do for me that's pleasurable and to me blogging isn't pleasurable in that way to me the the hard work of knitting together an argument is pleasurable yes uh, I guess I do it in a different way because I do it as I take notes boom I do, that's my note taking is I will take notes and then I'll have these as, asides where my stream of thought process gets written out and it doesn't have to look good. It doesn't have to have eloquent prose. It doesn't, you know, even have to make sense to anybody. It can even be a half formed, no, you're talking, that's really a ridiculous idea, Leanne, but it's. But try it. Yeah. And that kind of sits within my note taking. And, and that's fascinating to me. So, Leanne, that's brilliantly said. And then you produce two absolutely remarkable books very quickly. But, Thomas, I want to go to you and I building on Leanne's stuff because Leanne and I, um, we are in paid work and the academic jobs that we're in do not pay us to write. So if we are doing research, the research that we do happens outside of paid work. So we work uh, in academic life to pay bills doing particular functions that are not research. So you and I have had a lot of conversations, Thomas, about higher education and the workforce at the moment. Do you want to talk to us about the, the academic work of writing and how that nestles into that precariat workforce perhaps, mate? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think the first thing that really comes to mind, so I just did, wrote an article um, for a journal, it's not open access. They gave me the option to do open access, which I would have loved to do, but there was a little section in there that's like, what institution is paying for this to be open access? And I was like, ha, 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 institution, funny. We saw darkness in the culture. Oh. Yeah, I was like, so, you know, moving forward, I want to move towards that, but I'm realizing like both within the, even in an academic space where the writing is expected of you, that's so much outside of like the job, just the time that's spent outside of just, you know, operating with students, doing the teaching, doing the service, running the labs, for example, that like, that's not necessarily directly compensated for. It's like you're doing the writing to get prestige points so you don't lose your job in the future. And so there's all of that mess. And then like you were talking about with dissemination, you know, just disseminating research online is a job in of itself. Um, 
you know, I'm putting together a couple of podcasts that I want to guest on to talk about my article. And that's like several hours of like prep for those and then talking with those people and then disseminating those links and then making sure that that's all accessible. So it's, there's a lot of hidden labor in the academic publishing sphere, just if you are getting paid to do it even though that you're really actually just getting paid for prestige points as proxy for doing it. Thomas, I am so glad you and I have met, honestly. <laughs> it, it really, that's exactly how I feel. That is exactly how I feel. And it's great that, you know, we're separated by so much geographical space that we think so similarly about the nature of academic work. So brilliantly said, beautiful Romy, could I summon you to talk about the blog? Because you've talked so evocatively about Ahmed's blog, and it is a remarkable blog, but just mm. how it nestles into the nature of academic work in precariat times. Well, I think I would like to centre a, a practice-based word. My, my PhD is a practice-based PhD, and the word that I want to centre is praxis, yes. because I think that's really important here to think about the fact that, um, I, as I see it, um, Ahmed is using the blog as a means by which to not only dialogue with herself, but dialogue with an audience and an audience that isn't necessarily inside institutions. And if you think about what's happened to her, that she's publicly resigned her post um, and has, is known for having done that, she's speaking back to the system. So using the blog as a mode of processing academic thought mm. in dialogue with audiences that are not necessarily audiences inside institutions mm. is a way of dismantling the kind of power structures, if you like, that are at work within the system. And so this is sort of I mean, as long as you have access to a digital device, that is, this is about people not having to access it via shibboleth or whatever it is. This is open access online as long as you have a gadget and you're able to see her work in progress. And I think that practice based research is something that acknowledges that that knowledge that theories and concepts are processual. They come out of a process. We don't deny it. In fact, we want to show the workings out. And in a way that that's what the blog does, it shows the workings out. And she says that in one of the later blogs, which is the one called, um, it's the one from the 7th of December, where she talks, it's titled Complaint as Testimony. She says, today I sent complaint to my publishers. It's been an intense experience getting this book ready to send out into the world. Earlier this year, I shared the opening paragraphs from my conclusion, Complaint Collectives. I noted in that opening how much I'd been helped by doing this research. And then she goes, so what you kind of get, if you think about this as a performance, is you get the backstory. Mm -hmm. You don't just get the performance of the final book book in theatrical terms which is polished and you see the show and you don't see any of the labor or the hard workings out she shows you the strings she's showing you through the blog what it's taken to get there so it's a perfect example of process and Romy that's beautiful in terms of the language I would use from my disciplines it's scaffolding or it's multimodality, it's a multimodal academic yes. dissemination that's magnificent Romy so beautifully said I saw Leah Liam, yeah. Liam's become like your fan through the last five minutes. So Liam, you, you <laughs> nodded like you're about to lose your head, mate. So would you like to offer a comment on that, mate? I, I was just absolutely agreeing with everything that's Romy said. Um, I also noticed about this book, it was like an anthology. So it was like all the different theoretical kind of um, the philosophical arguments and all the personal reflexive notes all came together in this book and it answered so many questions about how the feminist killjoy functions and also gave a toolkit as well and i wanted to thank sarah ahmed for doing this you know for putting herself out there you know in such a vulnerable way I, i'm getting a bit teary now it's just like i went and read it i was so Liam, if you and i both start it doesn't end well mate doesn't Tara, it? I was so moved by it, like the the whole thing, like she brought it together and just so eloquently as well, like just how reading it and it was just beautiful to read. Like, Sorry, I'm, I'm 
being a bit theatrical myself now. But um, we're wearing the shirt for it, Liam, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I was just so moved by it. And someone who isn't high theory either in the way that I access write and the way I read, um, it was just so accessible as well. And it was just, and how she put her own personal examples from early childhood in there as well, and how that moved to present day. And, and she scaffolded all that information as well, like in her life story, she's brought of injected into that book as well. Yeah. So yeah, I'd call it an anthology of thought, really, that book. Liam, you rock. And I'm going straight to Alyssa now because I have an argument that, and obviously we've all as a family shared all these books, the highs and the lows, dear friends. And of course, this one did hang together very well and had an anthology element to it, I think caused by the blogs. So I'm going straight to Alyssa, who's going to share some of her remarkable work and commentary with us this week. So I'm always frightened what Alyssa's going to say. But I did want to talk about, Alyssa, with you about, firstly, your commentary <coughs> about the book and whether you're happy this week after our suck it conversation in the last few weeks to make sure you're comfortable. But also talking about feminism and complexity, because there is that great line, and this has disturbed me this week, what do you hear when you hear the word feminism? It is a word that fills me with hope and energy. And I think about what Elaine and I went through over the weekend on other social media platforms and, and hope and energy perhaps weren't the two words I would use. So firstly, um, the, the legend that is Alyssa, tell us about your journey through this book and then talk about feminism, hope and energy with us, my darling. Okay, so. Yes. So, I liked this book the most of all of them because I could actually, I like understood it a little bit, a lot more than, than the rest. Um, I did have a moment at the beginning where I thought she said something about trying to be less high. There was a, a little discussion about being high theory and that she tries to be a little bit more grounded than, than high theory or whatever. And that surprised me because to me, all of the reading that I've done so far, it's very like, ooh, up here. Um, and I found this book similarly, it was still quite abstract to me. Like, yes, there were examples, um, but a lot of it was very thought-based. I don't, I don't know. So I guess I found that interesting because although it was a progression towards maybe being a little bit more concrete and example-based, for me, it was still quite not. Yes. Um, yeah, but it's good. Um, I had, it, it prompted a lot of reflection for me um, in terms of the idea of the feminist snap. That was the, the chapter that I think I liked the most um, because I think I have a history of not snapping. Um, I think I've been trained to kind of be very flexible and bendable and kind of, you know when you like bend spaghetti and it almost snaps that's like how I think I've been a lot of the time. I never quite get pushed to that like point. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever thought like putting it in boiling water and stuff, mate, so it, it doesn't do that? I mean, isn't that the point of spaghetti or do, have I misread that? No, it's fun. It's just fun. It's just fun to snap spaghetti sometimes. It's, just, it's a metaphor. It's, it's, a, it's a metaphor and look, it is, it is, it is a great one. Yeah. But, just as, as we're starting to sort of round out this series, mate, you had that evocative conversation about your wonderful mum and your relationship with feminism and the difference, I think about two weeks ago. And I do wonder whether hope and energy is, is capturing what either your mum or you have in relation to feminism. Because I'll go to Elaine in a second, but it's, um, you know, ho hope. You know, I, I'm really in old goth land at the moment. I haven't got a lot of hope and energy about much at the moment. Where are you on this journey, my darling? I don't know. I, I like the idea of feminism evoking a feeling of hope. And, and I understand why it would for a lot of people. But for me, it's grounded. I just think conflict. Because for me, a lot of the time when I'm thinking about feminism or I'm, I'm trying to be feminist or I'm having those kind of discussions, it, it's conflict. So like, yeah. So for, And I think talking to my mom, I don't know if I necessarily see... I don't know if I necessarily see hope in that, in that I think she's hopeful that my niece will have a different experience and she's hopeful that I will have a different experience, but I don't think she has that hope necessarily personally. 
I feel like she feels too, like I think you get to a point where you're too deeply entrenched in your own situation that maybe it's easier to have hope for others than it is necessarily for change for yourself. And that's why Alyssa is in our lives because she does phrases like that. <laughs> Boom. Um, Elaine, hello, hello. Good evening, wonderful Elaine. How are you, darling? Good. I'm sorry I haven't been able to attend, but I was gone away for a while. So, but but um, you are here and you are back. So, just tell us about feminism and hope and energy for you, superstar. So, there's a group. Of, um, so, talking about blogs, um, I'm putting my PhD research out there in real time, and I, I don't I don't care. So, my my proposals out there, all the good, bad, and different. My candidacy papers and my proposal shows how the hell I got to why I was thinking what I was doing and and I and I like that I don't have a problem with people saying this is shit or it's got typos or it's all a bunch of sense making but for me the hope and the only hope I hold right now is this miraculous thing that we're doing in Canada and that is where a bunch of us women we call ourselves the underclass sisterhood of solidarity and I call them my research sisters, and we're coming together and using our collective knowledges and honoring ancestral knowledges and our lived experiences and our idea of what radical imagination is, which I don't think is what, it might be a little too much for Canadian university leaders, but they'll, they'll be okay to show not only how to include us in those non-bad ways that they do it, but why we're an important demographic. And through this underclass sisterhood of solidarity, where the hope lies is we're coming across age, race, gender, single moms, some don't have kids, all of those things. But what connects us is this underclass sisterhood piece that sits, I know, in a lot of tension with cultural war stuff going on, but it is where we're all holding hope because almost everybody's in hor horrific poverty, struggling and could be in worse poverty trying to go to school. But it's this piece that interestingly, when you talk about this underclass sisterhood of solidarity with other folks around the world, they're starting to be this, wow, this is like some hopeful, powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's about, that's at its best. And this is why I love you, Elaine, I'm so glad COVID through you and I in each other's path is if it's not about consciousness and community, I don't know what the hell we're doing. And you remind me of that every minute of every day, Elaine. You are a stunning human being. Adore you. And look, speaking of stunning human beings, look, our queen is back. Look, Gail, good, good morning, Gail. Let me look at your fabulous face, Gail. How are you, darling? I'm okay. Look, again, like Elaine, I'm sorry that I've not been able to be here for the last few weeks, but I've been doing my homework and I've been watching the YouTubes. Thank you for recording them. So I feel like I've been part of the conversation and I've, I've, I've missed you all. Um, I've loved hearing your voices and your ideas. So thank you. And Gail, uh, I just want to... how famous are they all? Aren't they just stunning super, now? Super, super famous. Super Karima's stunning. hair has just had a whole, it's, it's got its own Twitter <laughs> feed, I think, at the moment. Yeah, and Romy's on, on camera. When I saw you last time, Romy, you weren't on, on camera. We couldn't see you. So the last couple of weeks, I've been able to look at you as well. So look, it's, it's just been lovely. So I wanted to say thank you as well for continuing and presenting that to us, even though we weren't here on real time. A lot of us were engaging. Um, two things I wanted to pick up on. And I don't even know what your question was, Tara, so I'll come back to your question in a moment. Um, I, was re I was watching the um, discussions from last week about will and willpower um, and the one thing that I think that I wanted to kind of contribute or to, to think about for us to think about there is this notion of um, Nietzsche's kind of idea of, of, of um, the will to power as well. And, and, will, and that was actually, you know, he identified that only in, in certain types of hyper masculine men. Indeed. So I thought that that was quite interesting as well, that, that you know, that we might actually be referring to it as kind of what's well, been used against irreverent women often or those standing outside of um, behaviors that people would perceive as, as more acceptable um, naughty children naughty women etc anyway so that, I thought that was quite the will to power I thought was quite interesting I was also just reflecting on what Elise was just talking about now in terms of not always getting it 
not always getting the high theory, struggling with it, finding, finding it quite difficult. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge that often in the learning process, there's a liminal phase, that, that there's a point of liminality, that we're not quite inside and we're not quite outside that discourse, that we can't yet really assimilate it. And I think that that's okay. I think the first time we encounter really radically new ideas or concepts or ways of looking at the world, we're not necessarily ready yet to, to fully understand or engage with it. Um, and it might be in the second reading or it might be in two years time, somebody has a conversation or you read something and, and, and literally the penny drops. Yeah. And that's because Ahmed has actually already introduced and, you, and your brain's already started to kind of process some aspect of it. And I, I, so I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. But I'm going to sound quite paradoxical now as well. So I'm kind of okay with that in that I think that we're all on a journey and there's, there's, there's stages and phases of liminality within that and that's part of the learning process and that's absolutely legitimate. But I want to go back to some things that have been picked up about accessibility as well in terms of making um, academic work and theory accessible. Um, and I think that that's actually our responsibility as well. So I, I go back to, Thomas, I get what you're saying about the amount of work that it takes to then write a blog or, you know, um, engage in, in another form of selling your work or profiling and, and finding audiences, if you like, for your work. Um, it's exhausting and it's often ignored and um, certainly not built into our, our time and all of the rest of it. Anyway, so I understand that. But what I would say is this, and I just want to read something, so I'm just coming out of the screen for a second. Carrigan in 2017 claims that it's unconscionable for academics. I'm not talking about Ahmed because she's no longer part of that kind of academic structure necessarily at this point. Um, Carrigan 2017 claims that it's unconscionable for academics whose research has received a significant public investment to present their research outcomes solely in academic texts, which are inaccessible to most audiences, attract an average audience gulp of between three and eight readers and achieve little social or academic impact. So I thought that that was really interesting. So two things, one, I'm okay with high theory. I don't always get it. I don't always get it the first time and that's part of the learning process and it takes time to assimilate. So I get that. Um, but I also then look at this notion of responsibility. Yeah. If we are being paid by the taxpayer, yeah. And, and we're researching, say, for example, the lived experience of, or we're, we're researching women or mothers with rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Yes. Where's our responsibility in making sure that that community and the community around those mothers that need to know this lived experience and how they can support or whatever. Where's, where's our responsibility in, in creating dissemination processes that are really meaningfully accessible and impactful? So I do think that we've got a responsibility around how we disseminate and making accessible um, our work because actually most of it is, is most of it, we've, we've even if I'm not being paid directly now by an institution to do it, I went through an education system that was largely funded by taxpayers. In fact, solely I went through the comp system in the UK. Um, you know, the, these kind of self-made, I'm doing that there, self-made kind of millionaires that say, I don't want to share my profits because I entrepreneurially, individually created this artifact, which has sold so many times and the profit should come to me. And I know those arguments there about, well, hang on a minute, what about the education system? What about all of the people that have supported you in getting to that point? What about your chain of commerce that supported you? What about the police that, you know, and, and support, you know, rigors around patent or whatever, legislation, right? You know, everybody is supported by a million other people. So it's actually not just your profit either. Well, look, <laughs> to be had. So well said. And, and really, that was the project. The reason a lot of us got into this business was the Gramscian organic intellectual. That's what the point was. You understand a field or an area so well that you're able to translate it to diverse audiences. That's what the organic intellectual was. And I would argue even that fine project has been hatcheted by neoliberalism in terms of suddenly sharing with a community has become stakeholder engagement. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, do we actually ride the coattails and go, oh, yes, I'm engaging stakeholders 
whereas actually it's research dissemination to a diversity of communities that have a right to access free material. So then there's also there's all sorts of really quite significant class, gender, you name it, kind of other implications here in terms of privileging certain forms of discourse over another. Yes. So I, we still we still if you go the academic journal route, and like I understand exactly what you're saying there, Tom, it's that kind of prestige for the institution, for you, it's not about kind of necessarily just contributing to your discourse arena and community. It's actually about kind of maintaining or sustaining your position or making yourself employable and all of that stuff that goes with it. So I, I get that as well. But, you know, how we disseminate, if, if we use that, that typical journal article um, form and structure, we're supposed to be adopting a particular upper middle class dialect and structure and form. It's a particularly masculine way of knowing in terms of the way sections are demarcated and, and that we're supposed to have a particular kind of um, structure and form through which we communicate, etc. So I think that, you know, go back to, you know, Audrey, 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 and I'm sorry that she kind of gets, this gets dragged out all the time, but you can't dismantle the, um, the master's house by using the master's tools. So, you know, if you want to say something new and you want to reach new audiences, you kind of have to use different forms. You need to use new forms. Now, our challenge is how do we do that and still have that recognised within academia? Look, so well said. And again, as Thomas has argued so brilliantly, it's about open access. I use, and I'll do a free plug for them, the Directory of Open Access Journals, so doaj.org, and they list the uh, open access journals that are free, that allow you to have the free access. So we call that platinum open access, and that's tremendous. And I've made a commitment, and it may hurt my career, Gal, but I'm so close to death, I don't care, um, that, that I've made a commitment, of course, to care for and support and nurture in peer reviewing, but also where I place my stuff at the moment, people still read my stuff, which is amazing, but in Middle Eastern journals. Because I read a study five years ago mm. that Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, Saudi Arabian journals are not respected, not cited, and people don't go there. So once I read that research, I make sure at least three or four of my refereed articles every year uh, go into those journals. And if I peer review for anybody, I peer review for Middle Eastern journals. And that is perhaps an intervention mechanism as well. How much do we love Gail? We're straight to Thomas. Bring it home, brother. Come on. Um, I absolutely agree with Gail. Um, I think it's super important. I think my complaint comes from my very American uh, situation of my institutions are crumbling down around my ears. Um, so it's exhausting. Um, but I do have some hope, particularly with academic published or academic work and writing. Um, and just as an example, my research advisor, we do research on furries. Are y'all familiar with furries? Okay, so furries are amazing. I absolutely love them. We go to their conferences or their conventions. We set up a booth. We hand out surveys. We print out every single article we've ever written on them. We put it on the table and we talk with them for five days straight about our research. And every year we give a panel outlining the results of the past study to the furries for them to respond to and then give us feedback on to inform the next year's survey about what they're interested in and what they're invested in. And so while that particular article that I published recently is kind of outside of that realm, that's an area that I think of research participant engagement that I'm really, really proud of and really, really excited to keep moving forward. So that's a part of my hope with this whole process is that I get to participate in that and get to meet people and, you know, share that research that way. So did want to share that with y'all. I thought y'all would find that interesting. Well, I say Alyssa's head has just exploded. I don't know if anyone saw that in real time, but I believe there's sort of blood and splatter on that <laughs> black, beautiful white wall behind her. So Thomas, you, I just want to be you, but you know that. Um, how fortunate are we to be sharing the earth with someone like you? You are a rock star. And look, that was so incredibly positive and buoyant. Could I summon my wife from a previous life, please? So Karima, should we, should we go negative, you and I? Should we go negative? Sure. I know with you that doesn't mean too negative. I can handle it. You scared me last time, but now well, I know I think I can handle yeah, it. Yeah, was it the skull? So look, Confidence, I, no. Yeah, look, I, you've got the hair for it, mate. So let, let's do... <laughs> 
and look, I'm obsessed by this phrase. And again, a lot of my friends on this call know why, but the feminist policer, right? The feminist policer. So what is the role of a feminist in policing behaviour. And wow, this is an appropriate conversation this week, isn't it, colleagues? Um, yeah. What is the role of, of the feminist policer? And can I just put my politics out there? And a lot of you know this. I'm a big believer in men's studies and masculinity studies. And I want lots of space for men and masculinity studies to work through men and masculinity studies. Just to give an example, if we're dealing with rape, then that's actually about blokes sorting out bloke business, right? Rape of, yeah, I'm talking about rape of women, does not have a lot to do with the women. It's got everything to do with blokes and bloke decisions. So we need to create the spaces for men, masculinity studies, men's studies, to have those productive conversations. So I don't even like the word patrol, but men managing masculinity in new ways, creating new spaces. Is that a feminist job, Karima? Do we need the feminist Felisa? Oh, yeah. well, you threw me there at the end. I could talk about my thoughts on the the concept of the feminist police, Do but I don't know if we need her or not. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Right? She needs reform, maybe, or there needs to be reform, police reform, right? Like we're always talking. Mm. But I really appreciated that about her book, because even though it's called Living a Feminist Life, it didn't necessarily... There were times where I felt like she was pushing maybe a certain idea of, of certain type of feminism and, and that was fine. I appreciated that, but I never, I never did feel like it was an instructional how to, and I didn't feel like she positioned herself even as an expert, which she is an expert, but she isn't an expert. Like I, I really did enjoy the book, but yeah, the concept of the feminist Policer, yeah, I don't know because I think you both need her and you don't need her. So you need her to do the right kind of, you know, she needs to be flexible, but she needs to have foundation. I don't know. It's a good question. It, look, it's a tough. And look, it destroys me. And I, I've spent the last twenty years thinking about this. Is the feminist job, is one of our roles to police behaviours, and that worries me a great deal. A great deal, Karima. So, so are you comfortable with it? Do you think there is a policing role to feminism? Where, where are you landing? Okay, police. When I think of police, I think of enforce. So she doesn't necessarily say we need to enforce anything. To me, she's almost saying you just, you know, the feminist killjoy, all she has to do is just not laugh at the joke or not... Uh, respond and you know what I mean so sh so I don't I don't know if police maybe is the word I would use maybe there's another word and, and that Karima, doesn't have the enforcement aspect to look, it I, I like that too but I also say I'm only laughing because also the great feminist line is always laughing in the wrong place too which I always manage with profound accuracy with my guffaw too so it's like I'm sort of a couple of packs of Winfield Redding when I laugh and I always laugh as Gail does I always laugh in the wrong spot and that's almost more disturbing I think because <laughs> I suppose he missed the joke but I found one that they didn't intend um you you're, rock you're an affect alien I'm a oh, look I'm an alien Thanks. Thanks for noting that. Alyssa's been trying to explain that to me for years. Again, Alyssa's head just exploded. Thank you so much for that. Zoom viewers have missed, missed the scale of Alyssa's <laughs> gestures this week. It's been stunning. Can I summon Amira? Because I need Amira to help me. Good, good evening, Amira. Hello. How is the light in my life? How are you going? I am well. How are you, Tara? Look, better for you being in our lives. And you changed thousands of people's lives when you were last in our, our beautiful seminar. So I wanted to get you to help me with consciousness and change, right? So the great line is, and this is from Ahmed, when you become a feminist, you find out very quickly what you aim to bring to an end someone else doesn't recognize exists, mm. which, which I love. Now, where are you? right now in your life on feminism and consciousness and feminism and change. So can feminism change something or can it create, which is also valuable, can it also create the consciousness, which is the mitigating stage to change? Where are you, Amira, on feminism and consciousness? I think the latter. I think feminism can 
create the consciousness for something to change. Um, and it can be a catalyst for change and vehicles for change. Can it necessarily change something? I am not sure. I think it has to create something new to counter instead of changing, because I don't think change in the current system is possible. Um, and, and in terms of raising consciousness, I know this week has sort of been particularly heavy with um, the Meghan Markle and Prince Harry interview that came out. Um, and you we want to talk about raising consciousness. I mean, that interview in and of itself to um, some people was shocking, but to me was shocking in sort of different ways. So if you talk about the kind of misogynoir that Meghan Markle um, as a biracial light-skinned black woman experiences, so those are the elements of her being a woman and then the race element um, intertwined and that intersection of it. And this is also what I really like about Ahmed's work is she, um, intersectionality is so embedded in everything that she talks about. Um, and to me, that's also always really powerful because feminism that doesn't acknowledge that to me isn't really feminism. Um, it's sort of a, a whitewashing of other things um, that I have no business in in, in partaking in. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Look, look it does. And Amira, let's let's go to the to the um, Meghan Markle and Harry conversation because again, just to loop back, and Liam may want to pop in at any point on this, but. There was that fascin. I was almost more fascinated by the, the Harry component of the interview. And I thought of you when his interview came up because he, of course, said, I wasn't even aware of race or racism. Water anyone? Water anyone? Those of us that are that are carrying through the seminar series. So the idea that he was so completely unaware. And when he got aware, his father, the future King of England, stopped taking his calls. Yes, yes, yeah, that was his, his answers were very, um, very re revealing and he was really earnest in that. Um, and also his, I think there was a line in which he said, and um, and I, I, I did my educating and I'm trying to educate my, my family. And I think, so I think there's value in and um, a sincerity in people that say that, that, you know, change starts from educating and let's be kind and compassionate and educate one another, but also let's not be ridiculous and let's not, um, we can't educate our way out of delusion uh, um, and forced ignorance. Um, and I think sometimes that's how also whiteness operates in and of itself is to let, is to uh, move through the lens of, a false sense of empathy that that doesn't really exist in order to um, hide the brutality of white supremacy and racism on particularly impacting black people and other people of color as well and by the way this also then impacts other marginalized communities including women including trans people including poor people including working class people um, so it, it starts from that lens and then spreads out Right, again, is anyone else just like emotional about, uh, Tom's, Thomas is about to lose it, I'm about to lose it. No. I mean, that's it. That What you've just captured there has changed my life. Again, you must stop doing this, Amira, because I'm getting too old for these existential changes in my life, mate. Um, amazing. Can, can I go to Liam? Because obviously Liam is doing a huge amount of research on younger crew as well. And that, that's your project, Liam. Now, obviously you are a, a wonderful man in the northwest of England, God's country, Manchester rules. We know that, but but how how you know you can use the Meghan Markle example if you like. But what what do men do now? What's the space of men in and through feminism? What does a feminist life look like for a bloke in Manchester, Liam? I say I don't know. So I'm and. I don't have the same access to the same privilege I'm as, for example, a heteronormative, non-disabled, non-working class man in Manchester. So I will say I don't know. I'm from a working class community. And when I've spoken to my research participants um, about working classness and living in a community that is very marginalised, um, there's so many assumptions made of me. Um, as well from being from a Russell Group institution as well and accessing that space. Um, and I think that we have to get comfortable with the insider and outsider dichotomy as well in that and be reflexive. Um, intersectionality is also a key part of my work as well. So looking just beyond gender, race, social class, ethnicity, disability, 
and other forms of identity as well and looking at how they intermesh yeah. so that's really important to me as well but I feel like to say that you know I don't know um and I'm being led by my participants here yeah. and I think that's really important I'm um, to be honest about that and accountable as well you are a you are a legend Liam honestly you are an amazing researcher and an amazing human can I say but I wonder, Liam, where you are now, and you can you can be my more accurate mirror, right? Is part okay. of what feminist politics is about now, is it about creating spaces? Is it about creating new spaces for all sorts of people to find moments of consciousness, to find pivots and strategies for change? Is feminism about creating space? I think it's I think the the answers in the question that you've just asked it's about change as fundamental change as well it's not just about space um space can become such a banal concept it's about change as well but then again Sarah Ahmed puts on us in in this anthology that it's always the job of the feminist killjoy to be the the space for change and the responsibility that comes with that and it's enormous and it resulted in Sarah Ahmed leaving the institution, but she didn't leave academia. So I think there needs to be a distinction between those two things. She left an institution, but she did not leave academia. Exactly. So I wonder, Liam, if it's about the feminist policer or if the feminist is at the gate and opens the gate. I think the feminist is transformative. Yeah of all of this <laughs> it's like the feminine but then there's a labor behind that and it's always put on that person and that body i, I can i'll leave that. it there yeah we're, we're so there liam we are so i'm so glad you stayed up tonight this is fantastic um you are a wonderful human being and we will get there your work is stunning can I go to Melanie? Mel, I hoped you'd be on the call because I did have a moment for you and I to to have an engagement how are you my queen Great. How are you? Good. How, how fantastically moving has, has this evening been? Oh, it's wonderful. I think this is probably my favorite book of hers um, that we've read. Look, I thought it uh, would be. So I was just going to say, Mel, about thinking about theory and, and again, picking up from what Liam said about work there, feminist work, right? And theoretical work. And again, Ahmed in this book, and Alyssa, hold on to your bits, my darling, but she used that line, theoretical work is that that is in touch with a world that is the theoretical work I want to do. So it is the theoretical work that's in touch with the world. So theory, can and should theory be in touch with the world? Is there value in having theory that is in and of itself or should it hook into something else, Mel? Where are you on this? Um, I think, I think what I really love about this book, um, is that like Karima said, it's not a how to manual for how to live a feminist life. Rather, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that it is really difficult to live a feminist life. Like Liam was saying that there's a lot of labor behind all of this. And I think for me, the reason in this book, and I struggled with last week's book, um, but I think this book, the theory made more sense to me because she was, she was she was articulating like something I, th I feel like we can sense when we try to do this feminist work. We, you know, we know that it's hard and we know that it's 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 a challenge to be the feminist killjoy and to do all that. And, and, and she's kind of like she's theorizing it and kind of explaining the world that that we are living in, but maybe somehow we can't describe it for ourselves and kind of put our fingers on it for ourselves. Oh, that's beautiful. So feminist theory as vision, mm -hmm. as perspective, as lens. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. You are amazing, Mel. I knew you'd give me something remarkable like that. Straight to Thomas, or I think we're straight in to talk to Mel. Go, go, Thomas. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of speak to the pessimism earlier and kind of like what is our role as feminists and like particularly male feminists and when I mentioned earlier that, you know, living in the United States and watching my institutions crumble, a lot of feminist work I see that I need to be doing relates to, you know, getting people health care, getting people a living wage. Because here, like, those policies, even though they're universal, disproportionately benefit women, women of color, single women, um, with children. And so it's really hard 
to do feminist work here, at least for me, when I'm faced with like people like our dear Senator from Arizona, Kristen Cinema, who votes down the $15 minimum wage, but then turns around and calls herself a feminist. So I don't know how to grapple with feminism as the label, as the signifier, when I see the essential work of getting people like, you know, resources to live as so important to the feminist work in of itself. So that's, there's a lot of disconnect there with me. And, and Thomas, that's exactly where I am at the moment. I'm spending a lot of my activism work working on getting people a wage, getting people into stable employment. That's sort of my priority at the moment, because un unless you can pay your bills, all the consciousness in the world can't help you. And I mean, Leanne is, is in the same sort of space as I am. It's like the nature of the precariat workforce. So people can never even get stable housing, do not know how they're going to buy groceries. This, this is the priority of our time, I think, Thomas. Right. And I not to overly pick on Ahmed, but I feel like when I was reading this book, she like noticed me and she's like, you're going to call me a neoliberal. So let me like just check my boxes, dot my I's and cross my T's real quick. Um, but I went back to her comment about like not citing white men in her book. And I appreciate that sentiment 100 um, percent i love the idea you know the challenge of going to those other perspectives to cite i love making sure that our research is thorough but what is that in comparison to the mcdonald's worker who needs money to feed her kids like the ability to cite and to write and to publish is in of itself a privilege and i just I appreciate it from our perspective and in kind of the situation that we're in within academia, that that's something like a policy that we should implement. But in the larger framework, like very few people are in our space yes. to do the fighting in the first place. And, and a lot of us have come from pretty tough backgrounds, I know, on this call. And it is, it is a privilege to have had the, the education that a lot of us have had because our parents certainly didn't have it. And our grandparents certainly didn't have it. My grandfather couldn't read or write. Um, and as Leanne knows, B Big Kev was a carpenter. But as he said, Jesus is a carpenter. So, you know, that's that's the background that, that we're going through. So we're very aware. Look, I'm not tiling a roof in 40 degree Perth heat, right? So this is a, a different way of thinking about consciousness and change in politics. And Thomas has got us there. I just thank you so much, mate, for that. Absolutely legendary. Can we go to Queen Amanda, which may be our last stop of the day and how appropriate is this good morning amanda good morning everyone how are we all oh you magnificent human being you how are you going i'm well thank you you are great now i wanted to finish off with you and i hoped you would be here and you're here because this is the area i hope we would finish today and it's on academic sexism now noting where our wonderful colleagues have got us through in this conversation today, noting where Thomas has taken us up to this point, let's go to academic sexism. So quote, to be a feminist at work is or should be how we challenge ordinary and everyday sexism, including academic sexism, end of quote. So my question, Amanda, for us is that challenging of everyday sexism, which is exhausting work, as colleagues have talked about on this call, but also, how can that happen in a precariat workforce? So if you need money, you know, you need money to live and any critique of the system, there's, there's 300 people that can do your job now, today. So how do we manage the critique there while, while noting that, that there's 300 people that can replace us and we're out of work? This is a really hard part. I mean, as a, as a precarious academic in, in employee myself, um, who's juggling three casual jobs to make ends meet while doing my PhD. Um, how do you challenge that without risking your security? It's incredibly difficult. I mean, I sit on the academic board at my university and um, it's very interesting their perceptions and their interpretations of the precariousness of sessionals. And I won't go too much into it because I'm not allowed to, but it seems to be this very standardized neoliberalist concept that it is okay to utilize sessional work while also denigrating them as employees. So we were the first ones to get sacked in the COVID crisis without any sort of, you know, 
warning, whatever, just all of a sudden via email, sorry, we no longer have work for you. Um, and it was predominantly women who exist as sessionals, as casual employees um, who are trying to balance multiple tasks at the same time as get an education. Um, how do we challenge that? It's, it's incredibly difficult because you don't want to rock the boat too much because essentially if you do, you know that you will get the sack. And then what do you do? How do you exist in a structure that um, does not allow for your feminism to have a vocal voice? It's, it's a constant challenge. I don't know that there is an easy solution to it. I kind of believe that all we can do is keep speaking and keep talking. I was actually talking to a friend about having to get a little badge that just says feminist and we're at 24 seven every time I'm on campus, just to make the statement that there is feminism here, um, even though we don't always get the opportunity to voice as much as we would like to, because we are precarious and because we risk our safety in doing so. And how remarkable that in some ways that's a validation of silencing of feminist voices, but you're reclaiming through multimodality and a visual spark. The only thing, Amanda, I've done like that is I have a fantastic necklace that has, um, that is the Medusa, we call it the Medusa necklace. I don't know if you've seen it, but I have like about 300 snakes that come off it. So it just looks like a bit of bling, right? So when you're in a meeting, so you're in a corporate meeting in a suit, and you're in there and it just looks like you've got a bit too much bling. So they've gone, oh, Tara, we, we don't know what journey she's on today, bless her. It's a bit, a bit of bling. And then the empowered people get a bit closer and they go, bloody hell, they're snakes. And there's, there's something a bit feminist with that too. That I mean, we, Leanne and I have used haircuts and clothes and all sorts of things. And so you, you, you're a good corporate citizen. And then they go, bloody hell, is that a skull on a desk? And it's like, yeah, it is actually. You're feeling comfortable? Hope you're feeling real comfortable. So maybe that's the way we manage everyday sexism, colleagues, inside our universities and outside of it, is we just unsettle people a little bit. We just pick the scab. We make people have a bit of a second glance, Amanda. So it's like they go, oh, this is all normal. And they go, oh, this isn't really normal at all, is it? And in, in being unsettled, maybe that's our feminist future because that creates the space opens the gate and all the different voices can flood through. I don't think it's just a one track method though, if you don't oh, mind no. me saying, I think there's a two way street here. And I just would like to cite from Ahmed on uh, page five, where she says, yes. feminism as a collective movement is made out of how we are moved to become feminist in dialogue with others. A movement requires us to be moved. I love that. And so it is about an emotional life, beautiful Romy, and that works with so much of her incredible earlier research, but it's also about momentum. And for me, I've always been fascinated by movement. I mean, the wonderful John Uri's mobility studies changed my life, really. And it's understanding the power of momentum, just getting the political train on the tracks and getting it rolling. And once it's rolling, we don't necessarily know where it's going to go or how far it's going to go. Colleagues, I thank you so much in the middle of the night for so many of you. Again, a transformative experience for my life. I've learned so much today. And thank you to all our colleagues around the world who have joined us. You are spectacular humans. Thank you for changing my life once more. See you for our last gig next week. Love you. Bye, Karima.